Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel L. Conan, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Mark Mardiak on the line. He's a senior wealth strategist at Premier Wealth, the division of First Allied Securities. Mark, how you doing on this shortened trading week? Everything is going well, Joel. Happy uh, Monday to you and your listeners. Hello, Brianna. and uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me this morning. All right. The big question is, first of all, we've uh, got a little window dressing going on here at the end of the week, the end of the quarter. Uh, tr no trading on Friday because of Good Friday. What What's your outlook? You think they're going to be uh, trying to buy this market up and show that they're fully invested going into the next quarter? Or going to be a little bit of profit taking here over the next two days my sense is based on the data that i'm looking at and discussions that i'm having with clients is that there will be some buying and uh, many investors are very very pleased and, and poised to make this market go higher and there will be less selling the last month has just been very difficult but uh, i'm very sanguine about what's going on and uh, as you know, hanging over the equity markets has been have been the steady downward revisions in earning estimates, with uh, with warnings actually being issued, uh, if not daily, certainly uh, on a weekly basis for first quarter numbers that are are going to start rolling in uh, in a few weeks from now. Okay, and the dollar. The dollar really put a hurt on some of these stocks, like a stock like uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, first, I'll pull up the dollar chart. Uh, got kind of carried away. Uh, we pulled back. I mean, if you're, uh, you know, if you're looking for support, I'm just looking like the UUP here. You got to pull back. What, what, like a company like these big ma multinationals like uh, Procter & Gamble, what do you think? You think they're going to be able to recoup from that strong dollar at the end of last year in the first quarter, or it's going to weigh on earnings in Q1 as well? Well, I think it'll weigh on earnings. Uh, there, there's been a tight uh, inverse correlation between the dollar and profits of the large-cap multinational companies, which derive anywhere from 30% of their revenue, 30 to 35% of their revenue, 40% of their earnings abroad. So companies have been revising their guidance for earnings and revenue downwards, specifically because of that, because of the stronger dollar, and because of the bad weather, the inclement weather that we've seen in, uh, in, in, in February and in March, obviously. Okay, so a stock like you know Procter and Gamble here, what what you just you know or a sec the the sector pretty much not the individual stock, but the overall sector, the multinationals that have been affected by the dollar, what a one a one off or are they going to recover? Uh, I believe the sector will recover. Okay, uh, I think it's really important. Certain adjustments are being made to economic expectations. Uh, and, and, and we ask ourselves, right, as an investor, is, is, is the current pessimism, pessimism overdone? But a look back at history, Joel, would suggest that uh, that could be the case. Uh, the dollar has experienced two periods of significant strength relative to the currencies of ma major trading partners in the past, well, let's call it 45, 46 years. Both, both those periods produced strong economic and market results. So, for example, during the rising U.S. dollar period in the early 1980s, the S&P 500 generated an average annual total return of 16%, and that was uh, and real real GDP growth adjusted for inflation averaged 3.4 percent, positive 3.4 percent. And during the period spanning the late 90s. And early 2000s, the S&P generated, the S&P 500 generated an average annual total return of a little over 12%, and real GDP growth averaged a positive 3.6%. So we can look at that data historically, and we can make some, we can, we can draw some inferences from it. And of course, the future never looks exactly like the past. And the makeup of the S and P 500 and the dynamics of this recovery uh, and, and this economy are different now. 
And, and of course, the U.S. dollar is just one of many factors influencing uh, results in, in those two periods. But that, that's the point that should be acknowledged when considering the rising dollar today. Its impact will vary by company, by uh, the services sector. Uh, in this case, you mentioned you know, the sector and the, and the company that belongs to that sector, and, uh, and even by country. So, the, in fact, the U.S. dollar has not gained equally against all current currencies. So we're going to, we're going to, you know, what's going on with the stronger dollar is setting in motion these unexpected opportunities and consequences. And in particular, how individual companies respond to these challenges and how they respond will, will help determine, you know, the future winners and losers in the quest for uh, market share and profitability. Okay, how about the oil patch here? Uh, kind of took its uh, lick in here in the first quarter. Uh, crude, I mean, it, it, it stopped going down at least. You can't really say that it's, it's stabilized. But, uh, you know, some of these stocks have a nice dividend. Exxon Mobil, Chevron Corporation, they don't really need oil to go back to 70, 75 to continue to make money. Uh, what's your take on, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, oil sector stocks? You know, I think, I, I can't say, Joel, that there's a stabilization in the sector. And uh, a lot depends on what happens in, in Yemen and, and areas in the Middle East. We, we have to, you know, we, we have to see what plays out there geopolitically. Um, I'm not quite sure that uh, oil is a safe haven right now. Uh, if, if you're worried about volatility, I would not uh, advise uh, your audience and, and my clients to uh, build the position in oil just yet. Although I have colleagues that believe that now is the time to buy, that there will be a nice rebound in oil and, and in the energy sector. But I'm playing it safe right now with my clients. Uh, I don't necessarily know that it's going to go down further, but I can't say that I feel comfortable that it's stabilized at this point in time. Okay, let's move on to a potential bubble out there, the biotech sector. Uh, big move on expiration Friday, uh, major profit-taking in that. Uh, what's your take on the biotech sector, the IBB in specific? I've been saying all along that it's the golden era of biotech for, uh, for, for investors. I think biotech is essential in, in the world today. And uh, with, with technology and healthcare and the fusion of the two and the latest discoveries in medicines, I don't see it going anywhere, to be honest with you. And if you, if you look at the healthcare sector and biotech under the healthcare sector umbrella, if you will, or part of the technology uh, sector, either way, it belongs in, in, in both places, even though it's unique onto itself, I see the growth continuing. So... I am not uh, one that is buying into the headline risk uh, with biosector, but I've noticed that investors have pared back, obviously, and have taken profits. There's nothing wrong with that. Profit-taking is really, really healthy as we near the end of any quarter, in particular this Q1. So uh, I, I still like biotech. I still believe it is the golden era of biotech. And, uh, and I'm not sure that the, this is going to sustain itself in terms of uh, the discussion about bubble, the bubble and whether uh, it's overbought. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see a, a, a rapid downward uh, movement in, in the biosec sector like we did for, see in, for example, in oil, which we just discussed. Okay, what about the financials? Uh, real nice article in uh, Barron's over the weekend about J.P. Morgan. Uh, the stock, uh, you know, just looking at the financial, maybe the, uh, the XL left here uh, may benefit from higher interest rates. What's your, what's your take on the financial sector? I recommend the, bio, the financial sectors to my uh, clients, Joel. I really like it. I think in a rising uh, rate environment, uh, financials will, will do very, very well. And uh, when you have uh, certain individuals that have come through the, the malaise and the, and the, and the, and the very bad uh, recession that we just experienced, indeed, you're right, uh, making the reference to Barron's 
and uh, and and Jamie Dimon in particular, uh, individuals like that have led their banks, uh, and 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 they've done a really good job. So I like the financial sector. I'm recommending the financial sector to my clients. So I think growth is going to be there, albeit slow and steady. But I think it's a really good time to be in the financial sector for investors. Uh, now I'm going to ask you the next question. I'm not sure you get involved in it because you seem like a pretty strict fundamental guy. But uh, what about social media stocks and the social media uh, ETF, SOCL? Well, I I think social media is doing really well, but you have to be selective as a stock picker, right? There are certain social media companies that have a lot of growth in front of them, and then there are some others that might be considered as mature. So as a sector, I think overall, look at it really carefully. Decide, you know, if you're putting money to work in the technology sector, you have to look carefully at the at the key or the or the more important social media companies out there. And again, going back to uh, leadership, look at the leaders that are running some of these social media companies. This this is a savvy group of individuals, both at the C level, meaning CEO and CFO level. Look at who's running the companies and understand how much cash they have if they want to do acquisitions and if they want to grow, because many of them will be doing just that. They'll be putting their cash to work because they feel that's the best way to develop shareholder value over time. So I do like uh, some select social media companies in that, in the technology sector. I'm recommending this technology sector uh, to to my clients and, and many of my clients, especially depending on their risk tolerance, right? And, 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 and their uh, opportunity to have growth uh, positions in their portfolio, social media under the tech uh, sector fits, fits that description for, you know, growth, long-term growth. And uh, as long as they're not relying on those, that sector, obviously for income uh, to take care of their, their, you know, their needs in retirement, for example. That would that would not be this the, you know those stocks would not be the stocks I'd recommend to my to my older clients that, that need income and need to be defensive in case there's volatility. Okay, um, you know, being close to uh, the Motor City here, uh, the auto sector. Uh, any comments on that? These stocks have kind of been range bound here. Uh, I guess you really can't throw Tesla in there. Any any comments on the auto sector? I like the auto sector. I think. As borrowing increases, we've seen consumer borrowing increase by 9% approximately year over year. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, not just you know credit in general for, for, for goods and services, but in particular the auto sector. I really believe that uh, Detroit has rebounded extremely well in terms of being more innovative and, and putting uh, – uh, options in cars and 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 other uh, selective uh, features and benefits that make make the consumer feel really good about buying American. So I really like the autom- automotive sector as well. I believe it. I believe it comes in you know under that consumer uh, sector and consumer services and consumer uh, uh, discretionary. So. Uh, where, again, like technology, if you're looking at, at individual stocks, you want to be in a position to be very selective about the companies that you're, you're talking about. And, again, good companies, solid, steady earnings and revenue growth and good leadership as well, especially in Detroit nowadays. Okay, just final comments on the market here. Uh, S&P's had a strong overnight session. Uh, we're getting some follow-through, shortened trading week, end of the quarter here. Uh, just give us uh, your quick outlook for, for the uh, Q1 earnings and for the remainder of the year. Of course. Consensus forecasts call for a, about a 4.5% drop in earnings for the S&P 500 from a year ago. So that if in fact, if it plays out, it'll mark the first year-over-year decline since Q3 of 2012, and it'll be the biggest drop since we got into this mess back in '09 with regards to the financial crisis. Now, I believe, obviously, you can allocate the blame to uh, a couple of factors. Uh, obviously, the strong dollar 
which we we mentioned at the top of the uh, broadcast, and really terrible weather. So uh, I think with these lowered uh, earnings project, you know, lower earnings estimates and revenue, actual revenue numbers, it, it's going to provide a pass for a lot of senior management in the coming weeks because the bar is dropping and it's an easier hurdle to, to clear. Uh, PE ratios, whether forward or trailing, have always been poor, poor predictors for future performance. A better approach for investors is to assume an average earnings growth of X percent. That could be anywhere from 4 to 6 percent. And then consider a range of price-to-earnings ratios. So uh, there's still a very good likelihood that these middle quarters, uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, are going to provide the real growth and, and stimulus to the markets and the economy that we've been looking for, much like a, 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 a repeat of last year at this time. Very poor weather in Q1, but the middle quarters provided a lot of, a lot of relief. So um, I think that uh, there's been you know, a, a, a lot stated about the dollar and while earning, you know, the strength of the dollar and while earnings estimates have been paired, They've been lowered less than the 15% plus rise in the trade weight in the trade weighted dollar that the trade weighted dollar would indicate. But uh, valuations have been stretched, so even a minor earnings setback relative to expectations in the coming weeks could be a little harmful, but it may not affect all sectors, and that's the case. So yeah, I can still call you a, a tepid bull then. You can call me a, a, a moderate tepid, tepid <laughs> bull. I'm sanguine. Yeah, that's a good that's a good description. I like that, y'all. Okay. All right. We have been on the line with Mark Martiak, and he is a senior wealth strategist at Premier Wealth, a division of First Allied Securities. Well, Mark, great insight on a lot of sectors and the market, call, uh, covering some macro for us as well. We appreciate you coming on. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you again soon. I look forward to it. Thanks again for the opportunity, Joel. Enjoy your day and enjoy the uh, the week ahead.